Welcome everybody to the uh, session on, on vehicles and data today. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think that uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just go down and ask each of our presenters to do a quick, quick introduction, uh, maybe uh, three or four minutes about what they do and how they're involved in this space. Um, I guess I'll start that off. Um, Steven Zoff, I'm the executive director of the Center for Automotive Research here at Stanford. Uh, backgrounds uh, in the uh, automotive space, eight years at Ford and BMW, and then uh, uh, with the USDOT on energy efficiency regulations, CAFE. Uh, Mark? Cool. Well, we have a qualm of BMW guys here, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, wasn't set up that way. Um, so um, I'm Mark Platchon. Um, I'm starting up a new venture fund called Icebreaker Ventures with a subtitle the Autonomous World Fund, so all things smart mobility and transportation related, uh, especially autonomous car, um, and more importantly, how that ripples out and affects everything that touches and depends on transportation is part of what that venture fund's all about. Most people around here know me as the BMW guy, because <laughs> I was the, the, we set up BMW Ventures about five or six years ago. And, and I was the partner here in the Valley, um, sort of helping out on that. Um, and uh, fell in love with how important autonomous driving is gonna be to change and improve transportation and s s our s s s cities. Adam? Uh, Adam Langton, I'm with BMW North America. Um, my title is Energy yeah, Services yeah, Manager. Really is. And, um, and so what, what that, in my role at BMW, I help develop energy products. Um, so I do research and do product development in the energy space uh, for products that are related to our electric vehicles. And, and that is primarily smart charging and stationary storage. Uh, prior to joining BMW, I worked for the California Public Utilities Commission, where I worked on electric vehicle policy and um, uh, carbon cap and trade policy as well. Good morning, I'm Jay McFarlane. I have not worked for BMW. <laughs> um, my Do you drive one? <laughs> I, I owned one once. <laughs> um, I currently work at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and have a joint appointment at UC Berkeley focused on sustainable transportation. Um, my background is in control systems and artificial intelligence and uh, high performance computing. And I have worked for General Motors um, in, in helped launch the OnStar system, which was the first at scale telematic system. And then that got me into uh, maps and uh, worked for Navtech, which turned into, was purchased by Nokia, which was then actually purchased by BMW, Audi, and Daimler. So I actually have worked for BMW. <laughs> so, uh, so I most recently moved to Lawrence Berkeley Labs. So that's my history. Okay, fantastic. So I, I think I wanted to start this off by just asking you all to say, uh, today, where do we stand today? What is the most effective way that companies are using data that's coming off of, of cars? Uh, Mark, what's, where do you think? Um, you know, I think the number, we'll start with a number. I think the number that's most important uh, to think about the data as we're going to talk about it is how many lives saved. Because, um, you know, right now, cars and guns each kill about 40,000 people in the United States. Solving the car problem is probably easier. Um, so let's get on with it. Um, it, it it's a... Uh, I mean, obviously, data is the fundamental part of autonomous driving um, and, and the way it can then be used to uh, implement improved safety um, as well as efficiency and other things is, is I think, the, uh, the motivating factor behind the data. Uh, I guess my, I, I'll offer maybe a local perspective <clears throat> on how that on data can be used. Um, I work on a pilot with PG&E where we're testing out smart charging um, from electric vehicles, trying to align uh, the charging of electric vehicles with times when the uh, grid is not congested or times when there's low cost and avoiding at times of charging when electricity is expensive. Uh, so what we're able to do is we, in that pilot, we actually don't rely on charging stations for the data. We rely on the vehicle system for the data. 
and we're able to communicate directly with the vehicle to, to get the vehicle to start or stop charging for that. So in this particular example, that vehicle data can be very, very useful and effective for managing the charging. We can understand how much uh, charge somebody needs. We can get information about when they're gonna depart on their trip. And then we can use that information to optimize their charging. And so that's our side of the data. And if we combine that with data from the grid, from the utilities and other folks, then we can uh, really get optimizations that really support the grid. Okay, so I'll come at it from a different perspective. So vehicles today are generating tons of data as, as well as your cell phones and map companies and the like, and the, um, um, like the Googles and the Apples are using that data right now to do the traffic and do all the routing, which is managing a lot of our traffic behavior right now. So that level, which is like probe data, which is you know just, just uh, a small portion of the vehicle data is being used currently. Now, what's happening is now we're, we've, these networked, uh, when the vehicles get connected now, now we have an opportunity to extend that into the vehicle bus data. And so a lot of startups right now are sticking ODB2 um, devices into the vehicles which makes some of the car companies happy or not happy, as it, as it may be, um, to get more detailed information. I think that data can be used for us to learn about how we experience the road network and learn more about how to control automated vehicles. But I don't think anybody is really doing that yet. I think maybe the car companies are. But most of the detailed bus level data is hidden behind the firewalls of the OEMs. Um, but what's also interesting is these vehicles are so powerful with their sensors now, um, all of that data now can be put together to create the high definition map, which is what automated vehicles are gonna need to do look aheads when they are uh, in their environment. So there's all kinds of opportunity coming. Everybody's working on it right now. Jane, I think that's a great segue, uh, and especially the, the two of you coming from a um, an OEM uh, perspective. Uh, that the number that that Mark had shared with me uh, on the, the amount of data created by AVs is on the order of four terabytes a day for just a couple of hours of driving, maybe. And so that, to me, uh, raises a number of technical challenges. One is is just well, how do you get that four terabytes off the vehicle into some somewhere you can do something with it? And then two is, what do you actually do in terms of, of storing and analyzing that data? Uh, Jane? You go. Yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I have um, spent the last five years digging through that kind of data. And so uh, one of my passions right now for our researchers in this room is uh, quality in big data, because we, we don't manage that well. Um, and I think we're going to have that in a big way in these new um, uh, digital environment, connected car environments. My personal opinion, where we'll probably get some, some interesting debate on, is um, the, the, we're not going to move all that data. We would be foolish to move all that data up there in real time. So we, we are going to end up partis, uh, uh, partitioning the data. There's going to be a lot of work done on the vehicle if, if, if we instrument them properly. Um, there will be uh, potentially work done at the edge, at the cell tower level, and then there'll be work done at the cloud. And so there's the challenge is how do we partition this properly so that the work gets done in the right places so that we're not moving all this data all over the place because it's expensive to move, it's expensive to store, and it's expensive to analyze. So we're going to have to be really clever about how we manage the data going forward. And I guess what I would add to that is um, for some of the projects like the, the energy projects that I work on, it's, it's, you don't need all that data. You don't need an enormous amount of data. Um, you need a, a certain uh, subset of the data that James describing. Uh, but you need to have good quality data. You need to have access to that. And in terms of using it, um, you, you need to make sure that you're respecting the privacy of the individuals and that you have cybersecurity um, elements in place also. So I think that's another important part of how you store it, how you treat it. Mark? Yeah, I think um, the, that, that number, and, and I, I, I found that number and, and threw it out there, you know, this four terabytes to drive a car around is crazy. 
obviously that's an Intel number and they put it out there as sort of the lead number so that their management can talk about how great their computing is compared to NVIDIA. Um, <laughs> fine. Um, the reality is, I mean, when you look at, at, you know, different applications need different data, but when you look at, for example, um, video cams that are looking out at the scene or video cams that are looking back at the driver or both, um, they only really need to, I mean, they're always generating the data, but they don't save it except 20 seconds before an accident and 20 seconds after an accident, or 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after, you know, a hard stop or an emergency <coughs> swerve or, or sort of interesting points to study. Otherwise, they throw the data away and don't worry about it. If you're talking about mapping, um, you know, Tesla cars, for example, are always collecting all the video they see, but they're comparing it against the map that they've got stored, and they only save the parts when suddenly it's different. You know, hey, the road's not where I thought it was going to be, the road, because there's a cone, there's a barrier, there's a stopped car, there's something. Okay, that's interesting. I need to send that upstairs, so it can then be processed and redistributed to everybody who's got a map, so they get a new map. But you only need a little tiny piece that this changed. So, so a lot of, I mean, there's a huge amount of data potential, but smart usage ends up sort of saying, I only need the pieces that are different. And that differentiating needs to happen locally and needs to happen really fast. Um, you know, if, if you're trying, and, and there are real-time things and there are not real-time things. The mapping stuff you can deal with in seconds or minutes later. If you're trying to put on the brakes before the car, you hit the car in front of you, that obviously has to happen locally. Nothing goes to the cloud. It's a done deal in microseconds. So I think, um, Adam, you brought up something interesting there, uh, the idea of, of customer privacy. And of course, nobody wants to see their data used against them. And this could be uh, unintentional it could be a, a leak, uh, some some exposure of data that's that's stored uh, stored in the cloud, or it com could be something a little bit uh, less perceptible, something like a rideshare company uh, deciding how much to charge you mm -hmm. simply based on knowing your willingness to pay to a high degree. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think that sort of the comfort level is in terms of people revealing data either ten intentionally or, or unintentionally? That's a good question. Um, I. As, as far as like an individual is concerned, I think it, it depends on where the individual is. It seems like in uh, Europe, there's kind of higher uh, awareness and sensitivity to how the, their data is used. And, and in the United States, it seems like from a consumer perspective, there's, uh, at least right now, there's less sensitivity to that. There's less concerns about that. Um, from a, like a business perspective, I guess the issue, uh, it, it raises issues with how do you work with another company then? Um, how do you share data with them and make sure that they're not going to use it either against you later on as a corporation or against your customers? I, I feel like from where I sit, and I'm kind of new to this this space in, in terms of the data, there's not a whole lot of clear rules on that, a lot of clear um, uh, you know, uh, protocols and things like that between different companies that make that, uh, that increase the comfort there. So it, it presents a challenge for for us when we're looking to work with somebody, because then we need to make sure, okay, who are all the people that they could share it with? How do they manage it? How do they share it? And then, you know, without having a clear set of rules there, it, it slows the process down for working with them. All right, I have a question. I want to ask a, a quick question related to data privacy. This is a real example. How many people think the, the how full is your gas tank, your fuel gauge level, or your battery charge level is a big secret. Who thinks who think if your who thinks your car's fuel level or state of charge of the battery is a big confidential secret that you're unwilling to share? Who's willing all right, I'll ask it this way. Who's willing to share the level of their gas gauge or the state of charge of their battery? Would you? Really? No kidding. None yeah. of you are Germans. <laughs> 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 we, this is a real battle we had at BMW. Um, if you want to 
pull into a charging station that is allocating power among various cars, and there's a limited number of, amount of power to allocate, then it would make sense to sort of give the guy who's most empty more, and the guy who's most full, you can charge them slower. They're all going to be there overnight, parked in the basement of the hotel or whatever. Um, and so we, we had a charging network that said, we'll prioritize based on urgent, how empty you are and how urgent you need it. I mean, if you're leaving right away, then we'll give you a full charge. Otherwise, we'll trickle charge you slowly. Um, and that means, obviously, each car has to share its, how full am I? That was not allowed. BMW was totally unwilling to share that with the charging operator um, because that was private information for the consumers. And yet it was to the benefit of the consumers to be able to get a smart charge. Absolutely not. It went all the way to the top. I can't explain. If I can offer a, a, a little counter to that. Um, so... BMW has a privacy agreement with each of its customers and it's in regards to how we use their data and how that data gets shared. And so whatever, if we're going to share any data, there's a chance that you need to, you need to look at that privacy agreement and see if it, if you need to change that, then you need to go back to the customer and get a new privacy agreement. So there are some challenges with, with sharing that, that you need to get the customer actually engaged and get, get that kind of commitment. I don't know if I wasn't involved in this particular issue, so I don't, I don't know exactly. Uh, but that's, that'd be one of the practical concerns is now you have to go back to the customer, get them to sign something. Um, and then you also have to know with that, whatever company you're working with, how are they using that and how are they going to protect it? How are they going to store it? Even if they're planning on, you know, they have no uh, intention to profit from it, you still have to make sure are they protecting all the cybersecurity and things like that. So I think those are challenges that we're just beginning to wrestle with. So I actually wanted to ask a question of the audience before uh, uh, Mark had jumped in. Uh, and this is actually, so Mark, yours is a, really a stated preference question, which is the comfort level of the audience. But I wanted to ask more of a revealed preference question. Is anybody here uh, participating in the California road use pricing trial, the basically pricing for VMT usage? Anybody? Really? That's actually surprising in this group. Um, how about in um, uh, progressive snapshot discount or some other uh, usage-based insurance? Wow. <laughs> okay, last one. Uh, how many of you participate in some crowdsourced uh, traffic system like Waze? Anybody use Waze? Okay. All right, quite a few. So, yeah, please. So, so let me get at that one. Okay, so, um, 80, so people that have to manage traffic have are working on survey data that's like five years old. So understanding mobility in the Bay Area, for example, who has all that data? 80% of mobility data is locked behind firewalls. The Googles and the Apples and everybody who is redirecting or, or directing us on our routes. Now think about what's actually happening here. Everybody now has dynamic routing on their on their phones. So who's managing traffic in the Bay Area? The Googles and the Apples and the Ways. And you know, uh, the cities have only a few levers to pull. They have uh, ramp metering, they have um, HOV lanes, things like that. But those apps are redirecting thousands of people m in minutes. So this is a huge problem is that the, the people who need the data to really understand the dynamics and the mobility issues of our freeways, and they're getting worse and worse, they don't have the data. So, and what happens is we, they, everybody stands behind the privacy problem, uh, that uh, we can't give the data, the lawyers will say, we can't do it. You get to, a, you know, I have spent seven months working with someone already trying to get some data about mobility. Anonymized data, but we can't get over the, 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 the hump. So the, just one more thing, and I'll get there. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to see is I'd like to see us to be able to decide where our data goes. Because we go, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree, every day on our apps and give away our location data. 
and the people who actually need it don't have it. The researchers who want to help change our transportation system, the cities, the government, don't have that data. So I live in a state, uh, I work up here, where we do have congestion-based toll pricing uh, for bridges and, and uh, HLB or SLB, which you want to pay a difference. And they do track all of that. So you have to have a special pass that is beyond just an RFID tag to participate and to be in those lanes during certain times of day. So I think it might vary state by state. Well, it's a per tiny percentage, though, mm -hmm. of, of all the people that are out there on those freeways right now. Yeah. And of course, if you're in Europe or in the UK, those systems exist as well. I mean, it's very expensive to be inside certain cities at certain times of day, especially right. if you're a commercial vehicle. You know, so. Well, in Europe, they don't put up with this. They just say, you will give us your data. It's, it's really, the governments have the data. So I think that, at least in the U.S., I know of uh, three specific ways, and you know, this is an energy conference, so I'd like to tie this back to, to energy goals. I know of three specific ways that at least some level of data is being used in, in pursuit of energy objectives. The first one of those that I thought I'd mention um, was actually looking at high-level odometer readings. So in the CAFE standard uh, last year, uh, USDOT switched from using uh, uh, NHTS, the travel survey uh, data, to using odometer reading data to get a profile of, of vehicle usage to estimate benefits. So that's one at least high level way. Uh, a second way that uh, I wanted to mention was the, the road, road use pricing or VMT based fees. That's another thing that we're starting to see more and more of. Um, another one is uh, what we're seeing with the recent modifications to uh, the OBD standard in California. So starting, I don't know if people in the audience know this, but starting in the next couple of years, California will start to gather long run and short run in use fuel economy from vehicles. They know actually gallons burned, not just trying to estimate it from miles traveled and, uh, and window sticker value. So I thought I'd ask our panel, you know, when we're talking about this, this environmental uh, space or, or energy space, what are ways that you know of that, that there's already some level of activity here using data in the, in the pursuit of, of environmental goals? Jane? Um. A really good example is some work that's going on at UC Berkeley and the PATH uh, organization looking at connected automated cruise control. So, so for energy um, um, perspective. And it's a very interesting studies going on that, you know, we as human beings are not very good at, at car following. And um, there's a study where they put uh, a bunch of vehicles in a circle and had everybody follow each other, and it goes unstable all, uh, all, almost immediately, right? <laughs> and then you can do automated cruise control, which is interesting, but it, it has a lot of variation. But if you connect the vehicles, um, if you put a connected automated vehicle in the flow of the traffic, it smooths the whole thing out. And that can have a really great impact on our energy use because we, we have a lot of variability in these congested corridors. So there, that's a really good example where connected automated vehicles will really help with our energy use. Adam, how about you? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it, sort of to echo that, there's a local company that started by guys out of Stanford and Tesla, Peloton. Many of you probably know Peloton. That's about truck following truck, platooning trucks. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that, that's the cool thing there is uh, everybody knows that the truck that's following gets about a 10% fuel savings, which is a big deal. Um, but the front truck also gets a fuel saving. It's not like the front truck has to do more work to pull the back truck. The front truck gets a benefit of about 4%. The back truck gets about 10%. The combined benefit's huge. So these things work out. So on the uh, another angle on the energy side, I, I'd say on the, thinking about smart charging, uh, the utilities, at least in California and nationally eventually, are, are looking at getting a lot more renewables on their grid. And with renewables, particularly solar and wind, you can't control when that generation happens. So the utilities are looking at a whole different set of challenges to managing their grid. And electric vehicles can be a, a load resource that helps them balance that out and helps absorb those um, renewables. One of the ones that I'm particularly interested in is the idea of getting vehicle charging to align with solar in the afternoon. And that would be a case where you could 
where vehicle data could be really valuable for doing that. Um, if you're going to get vehicles to charge during the afternoon and absorb a lot of solar, you're probably going to need them to do less charging at night. So now you're going to need to manage multiple charging events to get that charging to actually take place in the afternoon. And you're also going to have to get somebody comfortable with the idea that they're not going to be full when they wake up in the morning, but they're going to go to work. They will make it to work and they will then be able to charge and maybe just get all solar energy in their vehicle. That would be a case where you need a lot of data and a lot of customer engagement. And maybe the customer engagement is even more important than the data aspect. But um, that's a case where you can take that data and you can use it to get the vehicle charging to happen where you want it to. So I think that's one where you can really, where the vehicle becomes very important to making that happen. Can I make a, I, I just said a very nice story about saving energy. So, and I think that we also need to think of the flip side, that um, if we get automated vehicles, we could very potentially have much higher energy use because people are willing to work farther away from their workplace because there might be zero occupancy vehicles out there um, and because we may never go to car sharing uh, or um, ride sharing. So there's, there's, there's an opportunity on both sides coming and we have to get ahead of that. We have to start now thinking about it so that we don't end up creating more vehicle miles. I think um, I have a couple um, more questions, no, but no, the no. goal, the goal <laughs> is more vehicle miles travel. That's the economy. We want growth. I, well, I think that th then we can oh. agree to disagree and let's go. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So we have, uh, I'm sure we have some burning questions from the audience. I have a few more, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming to the mic, please, so that we get your comments or questions on the, uh, on the video. Um, yes, sir. Oh. Okay, well, I have a question then, uh, <laughs> which, is, which has to do essentially with who's benefiting. Uh, so we're seeing, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, every day it seems that there's a new partnership. So, for instance, uh, the BMW, Intel, Delphi, Mobileye partnership, or the HERE partnership, uh, some of the others that we've been involved with. Uh, from an outsider's perspective, uh, it's hard to understand who's really benefiting from the data that's being generated from those partnerships. So if you're let's say, an investor, for example, and you want to know who's really benefiting from this partnership, how would you choose to evaluate that? I mean, the goal, the goal has to be that the consumer benefits, right? They get cheaper transportation, safer transportation, more mobility, cheaper deliveries, um, you know, um, less congestion, fewer accidents, the, the whole structure of those platforms is for the benefit of consumers, but the only way consumers benefit, I mean, if consumers benefit, then those companies also make money, and that's the virtuous circle. Um, it, they get tangled up in, in controlling their data and preventing consumers from doing what they want, but we'll work through that. Thanks. Adam, how would you how would you evaluate that? Who's who's benefiting in these partnerships? Uh, well, I, I it's hard to say in those specific examples because I don't work on the autonomous side, so I don't have as much insight to share there. Um, but what I can say is that I, I do agree with Mark that the customer needs to be um, the, in, in this case the driver. I'd say so, needs to be at the center of that. Um, but to make it work, uh, that drive, you know, the, the, the driver needs to be at the center. So when we do our smart charging programs, we're always looking to keep the, the driver at the very center of those programs. We want the driver making the decisions in those programs. We want the driver to benefit because if the driver doesn't benefit or they don't have control of it, then they may not participate. And if they don't participate, then you, um, you, you not achieve your goal. If that's in a smart charging context. I think those same broadly, those same concepts apply to other areas. Uh, potentially an autonomous as well. Mm. Jane? Well, I kind of think at the higher level, because I'm at now in the government level, is that we as the citizens have to benefit from this. And as I've already said, we're not, because we don't have the data in order to design our transit systems better and design our transportation systems better. So I, I do think we have to work through it, um, as, as, as Mark said. Um, and, and really find out how to uh, 
uh, anonymize effectively so that we can pull that data out and get it together. Um, the, vehicle, the OEMs will benefit as well if we do that properly. The HD map can't be built by just one fleet of BMWs. It has to be built by a fleet that crosses all of the links on the map. So at some level, everybody has to participate together. And as we do that, we, we need to find a way to engage um, uh, government, um, uh, public entities in that process as well. Well, that sure sounds like government wants to create a monopoly on data. I don't think we want to give them that much control. And I think if, <laughs> why should we? I mean, why can't a consortium of three automakers, you know, I mean, if BMW, Audi, and Volkswagen want to get together and share the day and make a map, Tesla wants to get together with somebody else and make a map, um, and, and three startups want to make maps and compete, to sell their maps to others. There's lots of mapping startups now. Um, why shouldn't they? And if they all have to aggregate it together under government control, no thanks. Uh, there, there's nobody suggesting under government control by any stretch of the imagination. That's what you said. That's, no, that's not what I said. I said I control it. It says that we need to understand mobility in our cities. And so, we, need to, we need to learn more about where people are going and why they're going there. I, I don't have a direct counter to that, but I guess we, we talked a lot about the data that's flowing out of, of vehicles, and, and, and but there's also other data flows that are, are critical to this. Um, the government actually has a lot of data that we would like to get that would help us, uh, in, in particularly in the energy space. So, for example, when it comes to smart charging, if we had detailed information about where the grid was congested or about renewable energy in real time on the grid, we could time the charging um, to align with that. That's data that utilities have that they don't share. Mm -hmm. So that's an example where if, if that data was flowing out from, at least from regulated entities, we'd be in a, a, a position to do a lot more as well. So I, I guess I just want to say that, that that can cut both ways. Yeah, so what kind of trade-off is that forcing you into? So that let's grab that specific example. Mm -hmm. So you guys are running a, a program actively right now on mm -hmm. effectively demand management, if I understand correctly. And so so the, so the lack of availability of information about the grid is forcing you to make some some trade-offs, right? Yeah, you can rely on more general information that, that is um, publicly available. Um, Kaiso makes um, information available about um, what's happening on the on the grid in terms of renewable energy and other elements. Um, but if you if you don't have those details, then you we just simply can't do some of the optimizations and, and create some of the benefits. Uh, we just we can make estimates of where we think those happen, and that's useful in a research context in a limited sense because it proves what functionality you have. So you can say, oh, if um, if I have this hourly data, I could do this. If I have this um, five minute data or real time data, I could do this. I think that's Adam. That's a great one to talk about for a moment because I mean, when I had my BMW electric car, um, the 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 rates tell you to charge starting at midnight because that's your cheapest rate and they penalize you at, if you charge in the afternoon because that's your peak rates and yet these days the ISO actually wants you to charge just like you said in the afternoon because that's when they've got lots of solar to get rid of but if they want to charge you the highest price then obviously the incentive is to charge at night when the electricity is at 10 cents. So, so we've got government sort of saying charge in the afternoon when it's the highest price. Is that because they want the revenue or because they really want to manage the grid? I, mean, I would say it's more of like a, a legacy um, of the, you know, the rates are hard to change and it takes a long time to change those. And uh, we're coming from a historical system where the, the, costs were highest in the afternoon and so yeah. that's that's a, a slow thing and then there's also concerns about uh, you know uh, uh, customer fairness and equity and things like that that are trying to be managed but uh, part of the reason those issues come up is because we don't have that data that allows us to, to do a better job on them yeah yes sir hi i'm old enough to remember when elevators had drivers <laughs> and we all take autonomous elevators pretty much for granted now we don't feel scared 
when we get in one. I live in Mountain View. I've been seeing Waymo driverless cars on the streets where I live for four years now. Uh, and I am sure that autonomous electric vehicles are going to be everywhere in 20-ish years. So my, my question has to do with, if we go from a world where the average car is driven an hour or two a day to a world where the average car is driven eight or 10 hours a day, we will need about 25% as many cars as we have today. How are the automobile industry companies in the industry going to be able to cope with a reduction in demand for their product of 75% over a period of 20 years. Now that's, that's a data formed question, perhaps not the kind of data that you were thinking about, but I think it's, it's a critical issue because shrinking industries get desperate and they do crazy things like the coal industry is currently doing. Uh, I think that the winners will all be the autonomous companies, but I'd love to hear your take on how the shrinkage of the car fleet might play out over the next two decades? So I guess I'm not a panelist, but I'm going to feel this one anyway, <laughs> using moderator privilege, but because I think that that's a very important point that you're bringing up. The idea that you need 25% uh, the number of cars, like that's an, a figure that you see uh, different estimates of, uh, does not mean the same thing as 25% of the vehicle sales. So vehicle sales are basically a function of, of three things. It's basically VMT, sort of vehicle miles traveled or, or passenger miles traveled, let's say, the ratio of, of PMT to VMT, which isn't just another way of saying occupancy, and then how long do the cars last? So dur it's durability. And if the durability doesn't change that much and the occupancy doesn't change ma that much, that means that vehicle sales will roughly track uh, passenger miles traveled, right? So I don't see a shortfall in, in vehicle sales anytime soon. That having been said, that doesn't mean the profit margins will be maintained. So if, if right now the profit margins are not great on, on making cars, if we move to a more heavily mobility-focused system, you can bet those margins will shrink. So I think that your, your final point, uh, desperate companies do desperate things, is possibly a valid concern. But I don't think it'll be to, uh, as a result of, of vehicle sales. I say desperate companies do creative things. Um, you know, I think you look at automakers today and they're all trying to transition from being automakers to mobility suppliers um, and they're launching their versions of uber or lyft or triple a just launched gig and and volkswagen just launched another one and and so you're seeing companies saying how do i get a different piece of the pie do i do you do I sell subscriptions for mobility and you buy your transportation from me, but you also buy a lot of other services from them? Um, do you get your energy management and your backup power from the car company? Do you get your solar panels from your car company? Um, you know, so I think you're right. Car companies are changing and I agree. It's all going to be tied to how many vehicle miles you go. Um, electric cars may well last longer. You know, instead of 200,000 miles, they might last four or 500,000 miles. But then they'll need a lot of maintenance, a lot of service, a lot of fixing. You put cars into multi-use sharing and people abuse the heck out of them. Take a look at a rental car. Um, so things are just going to be a little different. But those companies are getting very creative and very energetic about these investments in in new business models. Uh, the example I can provide on that uh, from the BMW perspective is uh, we launched uh, a, a car sharing service called Reach Now. Uh, we, the original version of that was actually here in the Bay Area. It was called Drive Now. Um, and that's, so Reach Now is based in Seattle. So um, that's an example where BMW is exploring a new kind of um, uh, model for providing mobility services. The, the, the scary part is, the data says we're not yet getting rid of our first car, but the ownership of second cars is dropping like a rock. And people are using Uber or Lyft as their second car. Yes, sir. Uh, John Bozell with CalStart. Um, we, this term um, autonomous vehicle kind of gets thrown around a lot. Uh, and I, I think we're at a point where, you know, what does it really mean? Uh, there is the level five autonomy where 
or level four, I think it is. I'm even confused myself now. But where somebody is, you're in the car and the car is driving itself. And, and under a scenario like that, you could see an incredible increase in congestion. Uh, people willing, doing, getting a lot of stuff done while they're sitting behind their, their, their wheel of the car. Uh, Volvo runs an ad where you know you push a button, the car takes over, you take a nap, uh, and and so you could easily then see this encouraging uh, suburban expansion, more people living out in San Joaquin Valley, commuting in the Silicon Valley. Um, so there's that scenario, and then there's the scenario which you've been talking about more the autonomous, where we move a lot of people decide to move to a subscription service. Your thoughts about, and I know it's largely a data panel, but uh, even as, as it relates to data on public policies to encourage, you know, that we move in, in that right direction, uh, that we get reduced congestion, we get a better mobility system, uh, we get zero emissions, we're addressing the climate threat. What are the right public policies that, you know, we should be thinking about at this point? Uh, I'll, I'll get a start on that. Yes, um, I actually work on a, a program called Smart Mobility that is sponsored by the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, the challenge here, this isn't a system of systems, it's a very complex system of systems. You've got urban planning issues, you've got, um, you know, infrastructure issues, you've got uh, multimodal, you've got um, the pesky humans in the middle of all of this just deciding I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do that today and not be uh, predictive. Um, so it's a very, very complex system of systems. And we, we need to start now thinking about these things because one of the behavioral things is you can't start charging something. It's very hard to start charging for things that people have had for free before. So policy has to really start thinking about these things now. Well, research says that. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll just say researchers say Parking that. on the street used to be free, then they put meters in. That's, I think that's an economic term called loss aversion, which I think is supported in the literature. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> so uh, so uh, now I've forgotten what I was going to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I think that we have a lot of thinking to do about how to guide this. Um, I, am, I am a Debbie Downer of automated vehicles, just so you know, because I think level five is not, um, not 10 years away. I think it's decades away because of the dynamics of the environment that it has to operate in. So the Waymos and the like are great. They're little tiny pods that run around at 25 miles per hour. When we start really getting level five, a lot of people don't think level four will ever exist. And level five in a mixed heterogeneous environment is going to be very hard to manage because you're going to have to put intelligent agents inside those vehicles to operate cooperatively with all those pesky humans that are not automated. So I have the the, the downer side of that utopia of all these little vehicles driving around because there's so much dynamics in the environment. I think I, I know that Mark and, will and disagree with me. And computers will on never that. win at Go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes, sir. A um, couple couple comments. Um, one, uh, you know, I think a lot of the conversation has been focused on the U.S. Uh, so mentioned 40,000 deaths in the U.S. There's actually 1.2 to 1.5 million per year globally. Um, and also, you know, the systems in all the other countries of the world are, are way different than they are here, uh, which brings up my question. So I, I, I wanted to get from my house today to here. That's all I care about. I just wanted to get from here to there. Uh, so that's what I want, you know, out of automated transportation. And um, in other countries, bicycles, for instance, are, uh, are, are a big thing. Uh, I was just in Chicago, didn't use a car for a week in Chicago, right? I used a transit system, I used Uber. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering about the data and how that would fit into my scenario. Getting from point A to point B might be bicycle, might be train, might be Uber, automated car, um, and how, how that would uh, play into that. Well, you know, I think that there uh, are three big pieces of um, the sort of this utopian mobility future that we all really hope happens. And I would say, first, th first thing is we need to make reliable vehicles. And we're already doing that pretty well today. There are a lot of companies that know how to do that. 
The second piece I would say is developing a viable package of, of let's say automated vehicle sensors and algorithms that can, that can operate. And then the third piece is essentially demand modeling, which is knowing where people are, where they want to go, and critically, how much they're willing to pay. And uh, that piece is, is held very closely. The second and third pieces really are held very closely by, by just a few companies right now. Um, so I, I, I think that, that when you talk about uh, really your question and, and the prior question about you know, how do you get from point A to point B and how do you manage potentially an explosion in, in VMT, what I would look for really is, is use of curb space going forward, at least in, in urban areas. Um, you know, the, the freeing up of parking spaces could be used for new travel lanes, right? Could be used for bike sharing racks, could be used for bike lanes, could be used for sidewalks, could be used for new, new retail space. There are dozens of things that you could do with that new space. And I think that, that really that's going to be the key to figure out how easy that mobility is in the future. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Ruth Marino. Um, I just want to know what type of data is out there uh, right now uh, that would help both the private sector and the government uh, to determine uh, where to put um, new vehicle charging stations and how many to put out there? We've got some people that are equipped to answer that here. <laughs> Go ahead. Here. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's some uh, transportation data uh, you know, like the National Transportation Household Survey was the one that NHTS, sounds like they're moving yeah. away from now, but that's been um, used in, in the past to study that. Um, one of the interesting opportunities related to data from, uh, in that area is if we have utility data, uh, very granular data on where the grid has excess capacity, um, as substations or, or uh, uh, transformers that have excess capacity. Um, if you have that data readily available, it's you know, really easy of, of, uh, for developers to see that and understand that. Um, they could then identify where you could put a charging station where you wouldn't have uh, an upgrade cost. Because the upgrade cost can be uh, $50,000, $100,000 in some cases. So it can be pretty significant relative to the cost of equipment. Um, I, there's two kind of contexts that I think are important. It's, you'd have fast charging where you have... Um, you probably have a little more flexibility over where you put it, so that data becomes a lot more uh, important when in, in a fast charging context because it's, it tends to be more of a destination for somebody because uh, they can park there for half an hour or hopefully less in the future and be able to charge. So they could use that data to cite to do. So. When you're talking about smaller, uh, in, uh, like level two charging, um, you don't. You have less flexibility over where you can in install it. You're probably trying to put it where somebody's already parking, so you have less flexibility then. So it's probably less relevant for that. Um, so yeah, I and mean, I think we'd want to look at you know what kind of um, uh, travel data is available, but also other aspects, parking data and and um, uh, utility data. I think would be really important. Jane. So there in the labs, there's a lot of work uh, the in agent-based modeling to do simulations of that will help you figure out where to site properly. Mm -hmm. But again, um, you need to know what the travel demand is on the, on the network because these vehicles are in, engaging with all the other vehicles that are out there and so they're in the congestion path. And you need to uh, ha have an understanding of where these vehicles live, which sometimes you can get it, sometimes, sometimes you can't. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a big challenge for um, the modelers. But, but, wait guys, the, the, with 200 mile range cars, which is going to be the baseline sort of table stakes for electric cars, you almost never charge in the wild. The need for randomly located public charging is minuscule. Most charging happens at work or at home. And we know, and Putting a charger in at home, um, you know, in in homes is easy, and apartments is doable. In in some areas, it's hard. I mean, um, there's just no place to do it. But the electrification of parking lots um, at work is happening. Think about what the charging companies like ChargePoint have learned. When we first started selling chargers, it was a big process of getting the facilities managers who ran the 
parking lot to buy a charger. And of course, the parking lot manager doesn't have any budget. He's not an important player in the corporate budgeting process. That has completely changed. When a company hires a new employee, they know I got to give them a new laptop. I need to give them a cell phone. I need to give them a charging station. It becomes an employee benefit part of the budget. And they know that for each hundred employees I buy, I hire today, I need three charging stations because that's how many electric, the penetration of electric cars is about that. As electric car penetration goes higher, that ratio changes, it gets cranked into the budget, employee benefits, knows I'm going to hire more people, I'm going to charge more, I'm going to electrify more parking spaces, move on. It's part of the process. I think that the one thing I would add to that question uh, is that it's important to know the difference between the last thousand electric vehicle customers and the next thousand electric vehicle customers. And so those people might not be reflective of each other. So as you know, as Mark said, you know, we're not dealing with 80 or 100 mile EVs anymore. We're dealing with 200 mile, 200 mile, 300 mile EVs now. And that means a very different thing. And the people that are willing to consider those vehicles are very different people. And I think that, yes, there will be a huge reliance on, on home charging. Uh, most people don't like going or, to or public charging stations and let work, workplace charging. Uh, but what we need to be looking at is the travel behavior of current gasoline vehicle owners and to see who we can do targeted marketing to for the next thousand vehicles. Yes, sir. Um, so um, this is a general question um, about the whole idea of transportation in the next 25 years. So we have uh, currently artificial intelligence going at a really fast speed. And uh, right now we have three million uh, uh, truck drivers that maybe within the next um, uh, 10 to 20 years they won't have their jobs we will have we have probably 2 million people 3 million people work for Walmart Costco all those companies that they don't need to commute to work anymore probably I mean because Amazon is disrupting them so there's like huge amount of um, disruption going on in automation in the whole industry that people in general are sort of the whole idea of transportation is questionable. Why do we need transportation? Like, especially massive, like, you know, transporting to work or something, because there's no jobs, right? There's some of these, some of these companies will actually get disrupted in a way that, you know, especially this, um, like, you know, jobs that are like, you know, uh, that are so routine. So uh, the automation, so the idea of automation, uh, what, what do you think of that? And, and how do you think this will, like, um, like disrupt the whole, uh, like, are we actually solving problem that wouldn't exist, like traffic, uh, in, the, in the next 25 years? Okay, so we got a dystopian view of the future. No, <laughs> no jobs, no transportation. Uh, anybody want to grab that one? Is that, is that what we're looking at? We're dealing with a non-existent problem because nobody's going anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take that. I mean... <laughs> Um, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, I think uh, automation is a really good thing because it takes a lot of the mundane activities out of our world. We're still human beings. We still have social lives. We're still um, we're still going to want to go places. Where it's 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 just going to make our lives a little better. Uh, our, and it's not going to displace all the truck drivers. We will still need to have people in the trucks for a variety of reasons for a very long time. So, you know, and we are social animals. The one, the one thing that I would like to see is, is, is this notion of hyper-local thinking, is that, that we need to start building our communities hyper-locally instead of stretching, you know, stretching uh, out into suburbia and that I have to go from my downtown condo in San, in San Francisco all the way across town to go to the veterinarian or to the dentist or things like that. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of change in our urban environments as we go forward, but I don't think it's going to no jobs and no, everybody stays at home and gets fat. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's exactly what they were worried about at every innovation along the way, right? 
I mean, if you had a combine and a guy could farm a thousand acres by himself, that'll put all the farmers out of work. But if you have that, then you create a thousand jobs in food processing and food delivery and food serving. So, so the, pro the, the problem works. with this wave, I think, is that uh, a lot of this uh, actually before, like, let's say we had f horse riders or like we had cars, right? All these kind of things that the jobs actually uh, were actually the job that need to do artificial intelligence, like one or two people can do like huge amount of automation, like the whole even coal industry. Uh, I read an article that in Australia, like 12 people manage like a whole, like all this, everything is automated. Even the coal industry that, right. you know, we think that, so we have like a, a huge amount of automation. I think we're going to have so, that. So I think that there are concerns about, uh, legitimate concerns, in fact, uh, that have sparked some studies yeah. here at Stanford looking at the interaction of, of AI and employment. I think that is a legitimate concern. I think your second point, which I, I would read to basically be a breakdown of well, look, our, our electronic connectivity and uh, um, uh, transportation complements or substitutes, right? That's a simple question. And, mm -hmm. and that's been addressed by, uh, I think it's Ed Glazer's group at Harvard, looking at, at whether those are complements and substitutes. And what they seem to be finding is that the more connected people are electronically, the more the, they want to travel anyway. So, I, I, and I don't think there's an immediate concern that, that people are going to stop driving around. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rod Sinks. I'm an elected official from the city of Cupertino. I helped set, found Silicon Valley uh, Clean Energy, and we're now providing 100% carbon-free electricity to 11 cities in Santa Clara County. Um, and I serve on the air board. And so my question with you with regard to transportation is, we now are finally beginning to see hydrogen vehicles. Um, that hydrogen largely is coming from uh, Bay Area refineries, so it's a cogeneration process. Uh, you could argue that that, although the owners are happy about their their greenness, um, that fuel is not particularly green. My question to you is: uh, Do you have a a model on which of these uh, two types is going to succeed, the all electric or the fuel cell powered car? And as an official that serves on the Air District here in the Bay Area where we've provided major incentive to create the EV charging infrastructure, you know, ought we also be looking to fund uh, hydrogen? And do you think perhaps in moving from if hydrogen vehicles take off, do you see a feasible scenario in California for building a lot more solar and then effectively creating hydrogen from that as a storage means when we're generating way too much solar, then we can consume on the grid, uh, and then yeah, consuming that as uh, in, yeah, that's, in that's an interesting for transportation. Point. So I'm I'm interested in how you see the dynamic and uh, what advice you'd give me as a public official, and you know either promoting the hydrogen model or taking it down. Thanks. Yes, I think that's an interesting point. You know, the discussion of hydrogen has largely been replaced by the EV discussion. Does that mean EV the hydrogen cars are going away, or are they just been delayed? I guess my first reaction to that would be it's hard for the government to predict the future of these technologies and it's hard in, in any technology um, space it's very hard to predict what well, will we happen. have money for grants and mm -hmm. we could cite stations in our community ought we be doing that real decisions for us to be making yeah it, it's a it, you know I'm not I don't work on the hydrogen side so I can't offer you a perspective of where it's where it's going along and I just would caution about the idea of trying to predict exactly where the future would go um, and what is more effective what uh, what California has been successful in at the state level is uh, trying to set in the outcomes that it wants so if they say we, you know we want the outcome that we want is uh, reduced emissions by X percent and then creating incentives that align with that, that are technology neutral, t seems to be the best way. That, I don't know if that addresses, your, your concern is more of a local concern. You're saying, look, I've got to make um, investment decisions now. We put now. several hundred million in grants for, to encourage hydrogen. Do we cite those stations or do we say, hey, no way, we like the, the pure EV model? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a large number of, of product plans over the years, and those do include hydrogen. I would say most of the bias towards hydrogen tends to be on heavier, longer-range vehicles. And so 
that to me doesn't lend itself immediately to sighting stations in an, in a, in an urban area. Possibly, I mean, it, it, it may right. make sense for fleets. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a, a $30 million hydrogen station, you know, can feed a fleet, but you don't want to place those all over the place to deal with cars. Right. It's nuts. It's an inefficient carrier of energy, not a generator of energy. Um, it's being propped up because government keeps throwing $30 million a pop at these stations. Adam? I guess the other thing I'd add to this, which I think um, gets missed a lot in this conversation about the all electric or the hydrogen is, I think there's an important role now, especially for plug-in hybrids to play um, because they, you can get pe you get a certain segment of the population that maybe doesn't care as much about the environmental benefits and isn't willing to make some of the sacrifices that are required for an all electric vehicle, they can buy the vehicle and uh, they don't have to use the plug if they don't want to. They, they don't have to have that. They don't have to have everything set up to accommodate that. And what I think we would find then is they will use it. They will use it when they can charge, uh, when, they, when they have opportunities to charge. They'll learn it without having to make a huge commitment in the beginning. And so I, I guess I'd like to see a, a little more focus on that because that's going to get a different segment of customers to adopt the vehicles. Totally agree with you. I think the consumer studies are all right down that path because EVs have been flat for years and years and years. And that's because you've that they've been sold to everybody who is inclined to buy an EV. <laughs> and so we need to end the Tesla jumped out by... Um, um, uh, appealing in a totally different segment. And um, well, so the changes in the vehicle, um, the way people make decisions about vehicles, they, they went to a different uh, consumer segment. Yeah, I think the plug-in hybrids to me remind me of that Mitch Hedberg joke that you know, uh, an, an escalator can never go out of order, it just becomes stairs, right? So a, a plug-in <laughs> plug hybrid can never go out of order, it just becomes a regular hybrid. So I think there's a, there's a lot of benefit there. But the good news is, this year over last year, electric car sales are up 44%. Yeah. This year, so far. So, and it's, it's, it's because we didn't make the right cars for the first two decades of electric exactly. cars. We made 70 mile, goofy looking things nobody wanted. Right. Instead of 200 mile things that are really better cars. Right. Right. Yes, sir. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Sure. Mine's pretty quick. I'm from Autotech Ventures. I'm interested in car data today. It seems the most valuable data is behind the OEM firewall. Everything else you can sort of collect with your phone. What's it going to take for OEMs to open that data to third parties, whether it be startups or governments? <laughs> well, you know, I got to tell you, even as uh, an academic, it's been extremely hard to get access to, uh, to data from OEMs. Yeah. Uh, that's something I've been trying to do for, for years now. Um, so I don't have any great news for you uh, if, you're, if you're an investor. Maybe give them some money. Uh, that's, I, although I, I would say that that data is only worth something if they use it. And many of the OEMs have not figured out how to use that data to their best advantage. Uh, so, uh, if you can bring t to the table something that they don't know how to do yet, that's probably worth a shot. It's actually getting worse. I mean, BMW just announced that the OBD2 port um, would only be functional yep. when it's static in a service garage yep. so that the s service technician can use data off the port. But if the car is moving, then the port's shut off. So that cuts out all of the people who made OBD2 yep. data things, the dongles, the insurance companies, the, all the benefits that consumers were getting because they'd hacked the OBD2 port, they're now going to well, you've prevent got, you from getting anything. You've got it. a gentleman here from the ARB that you could ask <laughs> to change that regulation for you. I mean, you know, I was at BMW trying to push for openness on that stuff and Obviously, didn't get anywhere. All right, Adam, you want to respond? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I can't respond generally to that. Um, I, I'd be happy to talk to you offline a little bit more and see, see, uh, you know, if there's opportunities. Um, 
I, I guess I'd go back to the idea that, you know, there is a customer privacy issue that becomes really important. Um, there's also a cybersecurity issue, which I mentioned before, which is also an important issue. So we've got to, we've got to manage those um, in, in terms of dealing with this. All right, Jane, you want the last word? Yeah, um, someone's got to figure out how to, um, they are not going to give the data out because there's too many, there's also a lot of information about the design of the vehicle in that data if you really worked hard at it. Um, that's what they say anyway. <laughs> so we, we are going to have to figure out how to partition this data so that we can allow levels of access to it. And, and nobody's doing any of that work. You can figure out the privacy issue. You can do K-means uh, privacy stuff. You can do all kinds of things, but nobody's doing that yet. And so we're, as I said earlier, we're gonna have to work through it uh, because every, it, it will benefit people. It will benefit transportation, it will benefit cities. It will benefit a lot of people if we can get to it. So we just need to work our way through it and find a way. All right, so we're out of time. Please continue this after the fact, and please join me in thanking our panel here today.